really horrible listening to that read out like that. I feel really stupid. I'm sure I've made half of those things up anyway. Um, Peter reminded me that it's probably a really good way to start the today because I had forgotten, I'm really embarrassed, that today is the International Remembrance Day for people we've lost uh, in the war on drugs. Um, and we're losing one gay man every 12 days in London from GBL overdoses. And that's a lot of my patients. And I know you've got, well, we've all, um, we all must have known people, and if we don't, we've cared for people, looked after people, but it's certainly really good that there's a day to remember them. So if we can, a minute silence. I know you've been patient enough already, but this is, just think of those, those people you've known for a minute. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So that was a nice introduction. It's really nice to be here. I've got a great history with this part of England. Because I've been up here a lot. I met a lot of you. Um, and I think since I saw a lot of you, Chemsex has gotten bigger or it's certainly more on your agendas or there's more people coming into your services that are, that are experiencing issues with it. We need to know more. So today's gonna be a brilliant day. Um, partly because it finishes tonight with the play, um, Chemsex Monologues, which is something uh, Sally mentioned in my introduction, the International Chemsex Forum, which was, we brought all of the stakeholders and people who were interested in healthcare about chemsex from all across Europe. And we decided one of the best ways to really acquaint healthcare workers, us, with, is, is to pull it out heartstrings so you can really get it. We can, uh, we can do training, I can teach you how to do care plans, I can teach you the, um, the pharmacological effects of this and the behavioural responses to this, but um, it really all makes sense when you see a little bit of theatre that really brings it home to us. So tonight's going to be awesome. It's going to be really, really good. I hope you can all come. Before then, the day's um, going to be broken up into bits. So I think before the break that we're going to have at quarter past two, I'm going to introduce you a lot of the, I've seen, seen so many familiar faces that I'm scared that the first bit is going to be boring for you. But there are some faces in the room that have to sort of start from scratch of what chemsex is and why we're here today. And the second part is of this afternoon is going to be, no one is leaving this room until you know how to guide someone who comes to you and says, help me, I'm engaging in chemsex and I don't know what to do. You will know exactly what to do with them for the next half hour and you're not leaving until you know, okay? Cool. Um, so it, the, the easier introduction is, yeah, my name's David Stewart and I work at 5016 Street, which is a sexual health clinic in London, um, not a drug service. I did actually begin my career in drug services though. After an arrest, I was volunteering in a drug service and because I'm loud and gay they, and a volunteer, and we treat volunteers nicely, of course, they said, do you want to look after, um, uh, be part of the gay part of the service, a service that looks after the gay men? I was like, yeah. But at the time, it was mostly ecstasy and dancing, and I think there was a bunch of volunteers running around the nightclubs, making sure everyone was okay on their ecstasy. They were okay on their ecstasy. But <laughs> the reason I'd been arrested and the reason that I was in that drug service in the first place is because I'd been using drugs, but it wasn't ecstasy. Well, I had. But that wasn't the one that'd be getting me into trouble. It was chemsex stuff. It was crystal methamphetamine, mephedrone, and G. And I knew that my gay brothers and my com gay community members were using this around the world in really, really large numbers. And yet, at this drug service, they said, oh yes, the gays do lots of ecstasy, don't they? Can we help them? I was like, oh my gosh. You know, we've got our work cut out here. We don't even really understand what the, what the cultures are doing. No blame, because it was very early days. Um, so that was kind of, so my, my career in understanding drugs work was in drug services, but I've shifted across to the sexual health clinics and I've kind of brought chemsex support with me in a way and I'll kind of explain why as an activist I felt like I had to do that. Um, but Sally and Alan were mentioning multidisciplinary work and 
as chemsex gets bigger and more and more people get engaged with it, and as we all fathom what is this and how do we respond to it, we do need drug services. We need the police and we need the sexual health clinics within the HIV services. We need gay community groups and support centres and we need therapists and we need pharmacists and doctors and nurses. We all need to work together to understand it because chemsex is weird in that it sort of attacks from all different angles and it's made up of so many different ingredients. In fact, it's called a syndemic. It's not described as an epidemic or a pandemic, which are more about geography and populations. It's a syndemic, which really just means um, the synergy of different things happening together. And I'll explain that better in a moment too. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think um, to describe or define chemsex from the very beginning, um, it's all about drugs. We've got a lot of drugs workers in the room. We all know that uh, people use different drugs for different reasons. And a person that's using heroin or crack cocaine, for instance, they're not doing those drugs to have a good time. You know, they're using those drugs. They're not, they're not doing those drugs to go out and have a dance or to, or to have a shag or, or to go partying or dinner parties or barbecues on Sundays. No, they're using those drugs for a very distinct purpose um, at large. And it's mostly about nursing trauma, some historical trauma, some self-loathing or wanting to numb out. They're kind of wanting the, the dissociative elements of those drugs. I mean, a lot of people describe heroin, for instance, as um, going back to the mother's womb or being wrapped in a warm blanket and feeling safe. That tells us why people are wanting to use the drug. Um, so it's a kind of an isolating high. It's not about empathising or engaging with others or, or confidence. It's really about feeling, in an isolated way, safe and warm and good. Gay men weren't using those drugs in very large numbers in England or in other parts of the world either. Um, in fact, gay men um, in very low numbers were using heroin and crack cocaine. What they were using are things like ecstasy, cocaine, MDMA, party drugs. These were drugs that they were socialising on. These were drugs that they did do at barbecues and dinner parties and, and on dance floors. So, I mean, if you've got the heroin using stereotype, and forgive me on this day of most days of using stereotypes, but, but um, uh, a stereotype of a heroin injector might be someone in a drug den or, or somewhere, but usually alone, perhaps injecting drugs and kind of wanting to feel good. It's not engaging with other people in a big way. And if you take the gay man stereotype using the party drugs that he likes, it's on a dance floor with a shirt off dancing and there's probably a rainbow flag somewhere nearby. <coughs> and um, yeah, so the point I'm making is that people do use drugs kind of for different reasons. This is all okay. All okay. So drug services really needed to understand heroin and crack cocaine because they led to problems quite dramatically. If you're looking at the trajectory of drug use, um, a person using heroin or crack cocaine for the very first time, let's say it's January, by August they might be needing some help from a drug, drug service because the trajectory to, from first use to uh, problematic use can be very fast. Um, if you take something like ecstasy, if a person uses ecstasy in January and uses it every week for 20 years, it's possible they still don't need to access drug services. It's kind of a different trajectory. And so where do chems fit into that? And that's kind of another thing I'll talk about in a minute too. I'm stacking up things to talk about later in case you're wondering what I'm doing. Um, It was kind of okay, I guess, the drug services weren't seeing a lot of gay men because they were using the ecstasy and the cocaine and the party drugs. And it was about dancing and it wasn't about a lot of harm. It wasn't about a lot of street homelessness. In fact, during, from, let's say from 1980 right through to 2000 plus, there were a lot of gay men. In fact, they say, uh, part, of, part of the picture, friends, from the lesbian and gay, what's it called now? LGBT Foundation. LGBT Foundation. I keep calling it the old name. Um, did the part of the picture project, which showed that gay men use, I think, seven times more drugs than their heterosexual counterparts. No one was surprised, really, but they weren't using the harmful ones, so we weren't seeing them in drug services. Those of you who work in drug services weren't seeing seven times more gay men than you were seeing heterosexual men, even though they were using seven times more drugs, because they were using party drugs. So in the, from 1980 through to 2000 plus, we didn't have a whole lot of gay men rushing to accident and emergency departments with overdoses from their ecstasy or cocaine. We didn't have a lot of gay men rushing to accident and emergency with um, violent related incidents like they might from, um, let's say, uh, a big night out on drinking. We didn't see a lot of gay men rushing to accident and emergency departments with withdrawal symptoms. Um, we didn't see gay men rushing to 
uh, drug services looking for needles to inject their ecstasy or, or cocaine very much. We didn't see a whole lot of we didn't see particular rises in HIV or sexually transmitted infections directly attributable to those party drugs. There were more. Wherever gay men have sex together, there are sort of more infections, but we didn't see a, particularly a particular rise in a public health concern sort of way in relation to those drugs. But something was changing kind of dramatically around about the year 2000 onward. And that was uh, a, a synergy, that's where the syndemic word comes in. It was a mixture of some different things happening. So it wasn't just the availability of new drugs, that was a part of it. But a whole lot of things were happening. I think the first one main thing that was kind of happening was HIV, which is a big deal for gay men. For decades now, we've been telling gay men to, that HIV is something they need to consider every time they go to bed, practically. We've been drumming in the message, a really important message about condoms and safe sex. Um, we've been telling them that the sex you have is dangerous, that it is risky, and you need to be skilled up about some medicines, you need to be skilled up about safe sex behaviours, or you could die, <laughs> practically. It really was like that a few decades back. But things were changing, because even though HIV care was getting better, amazing medicines, I'm HIV positive myself, 27 years, medicines are amazing now. But HIV prevention was getting really complicated because once upon a time, back in the day, if you wear a condom, you won't catch HIV. Really simple message. I mean, oh gosh, it was so simple. Who remembers those days? Don't catch HIV, you wear a condom, it was that simple. But things are changing dramatically because there was soon PEP came along. And PEP, for those who don't know, is it's kind of like the morning after pill. Um, if you have an HIV risk, you can go and take some medicine for a month. If you take the medicine within a couple of days, um, it pretty much guarantees you won't catch HIV. So there's another thing to add to the condoms, another way to avoid catching HIV. But there was also undetectable viral loads. I, for instance, have an undetectable viral load. If I had condomless sex and I came, forgive me, inside any of you, you can't catch HIV. And that was another thing we we're asking gay men to understand and take into the bedrooms, as well as PrEP. There's also PrEP, which is a new, uh, a new use of an old medicine, um, that if a person takes PrEP, this pill, every single day, and even if someone who has infectious HIV comes inside them, they can't catch it that way either. So, I mean, uh, we're asking this already kind of traumatised gay population that's been told that their sex is dangerous and risky to understand what PEP is, what PrEP is, what an undetectable viral load is, um, what safe sex is, to still use condoms, and, but also not only those very biomedical things, but we're asking them to have the communication skills to take that into the bedroom where there's a whole lot of other things going on in their mind anyway, like rejection and, and fear and feeling sexy and all that kind of stuff. So I think the first part of this syndemic synergy, synergy factor is HIV prevention was getting really complicated for an already kind of sexually traumatised group of people. Um, another thing that was happening was technology. Grinder was here. So the days of cruising uh, in public cruising grounds and going to public toilets and cruising, trying to find dates and sometimes even love in those kinds of environments, even where it had been normalised, some people think might be, it's fine to think that um, toilet sex is a bit revolting. I actually prefer not to have it myself. But weirdly, for a culture that was forced into it was the only way you could find partners, it was kind of accepted and normalised. And a lot of people got criminal records out of it, even though it was kind of, it was perceived unfair because they weren't allowed to hold hands or seek a date on the street. They could get arrested and imprisoned for it back in the day. So this technology, like Grindr and Gaydar and, uh, and all these other apps, like landed in the lap of these gay men overnight. And it didn't come with an instruction booklet. It didn't say, hey, the way you pursue sex and seek sex is going to change really slowly and gradually and will help you get you. No. <laughs> it's like right now, today, suddenly on your phone, there's an app and no shame. It completely disarmed. You don't need to go to cruising grounds anymore. It's got a GPS on it and you can find a date or a shag five minutes away from where you live. Some people here in the university even. <laughs> it's off, it's off, don't judge me. Um, so we think that would be a good thing, right? Being taken out of the toilet cubicles and the cruising grounds. Um, and it should be made less shameful on, on our apps. And, um, and it is a good thing. But again, like I said, it didn't come with any instruction booklet. I wish it did. I wish that Grindr came with an instruction booklet that said, hello gay men, 
here's a new thing for you. It's supposed to make things simpler and easier. Um, <coughs> Careful though, because it's, uh, you're going to need some skills to use this. You're going to need to, um, first of all, have an understanding of your sexual and emotional needs, and we're asking you to communicate that in a very limited number of characters with possibly a Photoshop picture and with an emoticon to communicate all of your sexual and emotional needs. Off you go. There was no instruction booklet that guided us to do that. I think it might have been left to, uh, I don't know, gay community organisations to try to fathom this, or perhaps the sexual health clinics who help people, under help people accessing the services to have better, safer sex. But there was no instruction book. It was just there. And, uh, and they were adopted very fast. This is a, a phenomenon in, in a technical and sexual revolution. It was overnight and it was dramatic. And gay men faster than any other population on the planet picked these things up and used them. And um, there is some evidence to show how the, the increase in sexually transmitted infections is directly relatable to that change. I think... Uh, without demonising them, because uh, they're just a tool. I don't want to demonise them. They have a good thing, but they didn't come with the instruction booklet. And the people that I see in clinic are really struggling with having an understanding of what their sexual and emotional needs are. I mean, I'm speaking to you today in English, in, in London English. I won't even do my Liverpoolian accent, but actually English is not my first language. When I came out of my mother's womb, I was very vulnerable and prone to danger. I needed to be fed, I needed to know I was safe. The very first language I learnt was looking up into my mum and dad's face for their facial expressions. It's the first language I learnt because I needed to feel safe. I needed to know that as such a vulnerable, tiny thing, I was protected by the parents. And this is true for all mammals, I think. And it was the first language I learned. And I tell you, I use that language a lot when I'm hooking up, when I'm in bed and when I'm trying to make intimacy happen. I'm using it now with you. I am, because I'm a bit nervous up here and I am looking at your kind faces and it helps me. It helps me in bed too and it helps me when I'm hooking up and it's something that's incredibly crucial and it's something that I can't communicate with an emoticon on my phone, no matter how hard I try, no matter how hard my patients are trying. To give an example, I think, of how this revolution is impacting my patients. Um, one of our clinics in, in London is called Dean Street Express, and it's, um, it's, it's designed for a fast turnover because we're just overwhelmed with brilliant gay men in London who want to have better sexual health. So, uh, for an example, the first guy might come in and he'll say, a, bu a busy nurse will see maybe 30 to 40 plus gay men in one day, in one or what two shifts in one day. So the first guy might come in and say, hi, I was at a sauna all weekend. Oh my God, I was there for three days. I did so many drugs. I had such a good time. Oh my God, there were so many gorgeous people there. I'm, I'm exhausted, but I, I can't remember much about it. I've got gonorrhea, I think. Can you fix me, please? I can't remember how I got it. I can't tell you all the information because it was three days. I was really high. I even passed out from G for a little bit of while in the cubicle, but whatever. Can I have my medicine, please? And the nurse is thinking, you know, yikes, so much to talk about there. Consent to sex. Or, you know, was, had he overdosed from G? Were people still having sex with him in that situation? She's thinking, is this the sex that you dreamed of having when you were younger? Is this the kind of sex and romantic life that you wanted? Maybe it is. Do you have the communication skills to communicate the boundaries? Do you have any boundaries to communicate? If you had the right skills to communicate them, la, la, la. Is this what you define as a good time? Not judgmentally, just pure question, is it? And, um, but of course, what the patient, and I'm going to be a little bit overly dramatic here, but what the patient will say is, is, don't judge me, please. This is normal for us gays. Don't do that heteronormative thing with me. We're fine, this is normal for us. I've been in the sauna last week, I've been in the sauna next week, I've had gonorrhea before, I'll have gonorrhea again. I just want my medicine, please. Don't judge me, I'm off. And of course, the nurses are very aware that there's another 50 guys waiting outside. I'm exaggerating a little, but I'm making a point. But the second guy comes in and he might need PEP because there was an HIV risk the night before. And so the nurse has to ask some questions about the infectiousness of the person involved in the possible transmission. And, and so she might ask, is the, is the person in the waiting room supporting you? Or can we get them on the phone to, to find out some details about if they're HIV positive, la, la, la. And he goes, I don't know. I don't know who it was, could be one of 10 guys, and I, I might know their grinder profile name if I'm lucky, but I don't know who they are. And don't judge me for being slutty with your heteronormative judgment, please. It's normal for us. I've had loads of sex with loads of guys before, and I will again. I just want my pet, please. I'm exaggerating again, but I'm trying to make a point because this kind of is happening. 
50 guys in a day, one after the other after the other, all sort of kind of reporting what I, perhaps judgmentally, might describe as poor sexual well-being, or certainly a poor understanding of what their sexual and emotional needs are and a poor understanding of the boundaries they might want to help them achieve the awesome sex they want um, and the communication skills to communicate those boundaries. And in a culture, which London's got it particularly bad, but in a culture was very hook-up friendly, um, where a lot of the guys, again, that we see kind of want to, if they want to have dinner with someone before the sex, and they might be far more relaxed in bed then, are too scared to say so because it's a hook-up culture. If they want someone to sleep over, that doesn't happen a lot, and they're almost scared to communicate that they want that because it's a vulnerability and it's not the culture. So it's certainly not true of all gay men, but this is what is feeding into the chemsex issues that we're seeing at our clinic. Because you know what? That's quite a lot of stuff going on in a sexual situation. I'd need drugs to feel that too. I really would. I'd need drugs to feel confident doing it. I'd need drugs to keep up. What they're communicating to us, I think, is that it's almost like there's this treadmill, a sexy treadmill, um, that they're on, of be sexy, be sexy. My community is saying be sexy. If I'm sexy, I will be on the guest list for the club. If I am sexy, I'll get the right boyfriend. If I'm sexy, I'll be welcome on the dance floor. If I'm sexy, people will admire me with the sexy guy that I've got next to me. If I'm sexy, everything will be okay. If I'm sexy, I won't be judged. If I'm sexy, I'll be popular. If I'm sexy, I'll find love. And at some point, they just kind of fall off that treadmill because it hasn't happened sometimes with an HIV infection, sometimes with a drug issue, sometimes with a whole lot of rejections, sometimes with a couple of hospital uh, overdoses from G, sometimes with a, a fear or dislike of their own community that, kind of they're, that they're participating in. Um, and, they wonder, and everything they thought their life was about, this sexiness that they thought would fix everything, hasn't worked and they're bereft and not sure what to do. So I find that what are the, a lot of the work we're doing in London, a lot of the health services, and I think the responsibility of the gay community organisations, and perhaps the health services, even the chemsex support services, picking up that, these guys that have fallen off that treadmill and wondering what's it all about. I told you that kind of drama story, just kind of because this is the impact that this technological revolution has had on a population. Not on everybody, but the ones certainly, it's, it's behind a lot of the chemsex presentations we're seeing. I mentioned a couple of things driving this endemic. So there was a HIV prevention getting more complicated. I talked about technology and Grindr and how it changed us. The other thing is drugs, new drugs. Between, um, hi. Don't be so shy. Hello. <laughs> um, so with these apps, around about the same time, around about the year 2000, a really dramatic shift was happening in the drugs. So Certain drugs have always mm, been associated with particular populations and groups. Then that's, there's nothing surprising about that. Gay men liked the party drugs and they weren't leading to a lot of harm. But something dramatic was changing because crystal methamphetamine was becoming more popular and available. Mephedrone was becoming more popular and available. And GHB, GBL, was becoming more popular and available. These are not ecstasy. These are not cocaine. These are really different drugs. And when I say different, I mean different. I mean, there's a lot of people in the room that may not have done drugs, a lot of years that did, but there's a lot of people that understand drugs pharmacologically. And I think forget everything that you've learnt before now. If you want to understand chemsex and drugs and how they're different, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to embarrass you. <laughs> so Sally, if you and I were doing heroin together, Uh, you know why we're doing it. We're not doing it to have a dance. But if we're going to, if, if sex and heroin was our thing, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a dreadful shag, because I'm high and I'm feeling safe and warm, and this is what I wanted. And even though you, this was meant to be a sexy thing, I'm just not there. This isn't working. I don't care. I'm feeling good. It's an introverted, safe, nice kind of thing. So I'm sorry to disappoint you. It might be a great relief. I don't know, but this sex thing is not going to happen. Uh, Peter, I'm going to embarrass you now. You and me, we're going to have sex on ecstasy. And this is an empathising drug. I like you so much. Oh, my gosh. And 
um, you have my full attention. Um, we're going to kiss a lot and touch a lot and it'll feel amazing. I'm not interested in anything else. I, I really care about you so much. I don't want you to catch my HIV. I'm quite confident to tell you everything about my entire personal life. I know you won't judge me because you're feeling the same way. You told me everything about yours and I was interested. And, oh my gosh, we had such an intimate, amazing, sensual, touchy, connecting time. Um, it really was very close and very, very intimate. And in the, in the morning, I'm giving you my favourite pair of sunglasses because the sun is shining and I kept you awake all night and I really, really, really care, even though I've never met him before and I'm probably never going to see him or those sunglasses ever again. But that's what it is. But it's not translating to... I held a lot of harm either. You know, I'm, I, I, so I have to repeat, I really don't want you to catch my HIV. I'm very aware of that. Ecstasy. There's no way because, you know, we are together. And when that... Madonna track came on that we both realised we both liked. Oh, my God, that blew our minds, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sam, you ready? <laughs> crystal meth, baby. Sam and I are going to have sex on crystal meth. Oh, my God. I, my dopamine has never been this high before. I'm like, I'm... <laughs> I can feel amazing. Do you know what I mean? Do you feel the same way too? I know you do. I'm like, I feel, oh my God, I'm so horny. I can't stand it. I've got to do something. I need stimulation. I kept... We did have amazing sex for like 10 minutes, but my God, we needed more stimulation and different because it's all getting a bit boring. Oh, yeah, you like, we should put that porn on. Yes, yes, yes. We faff around other things. We got the pipe ready and did it all again. We faffed. We needed more. We were having great sex, but we needed more. It wasn't stimulating enough because that's the nature of the high. It's keeping us going for three days. You're not stim... I love you, Sam, but you're, and you're very sexy but you're not stimulating enough for me for three days. <laughs> I need more. I need more everything. I need more risks. The sex we're doing, I need more... Uh, so I need more risks. Put a bigger thing up there. <laughs> Find me something more interesting to put there. Dangerous sex. Let's put that more extreme porn on because I need more stimulation. I need more stimulation. We're running out of drugs. We can get, like, get the grinder on. Oh, my God, to see that guy, to see that guy. Can you get him around? Can you get him around? Because he might bring some more Viagra too because it's getting a bit funny. Get him around. Can we... We've got three days of this. We might not even stay together the whole three days because I might go off and she might go off and do other things. Um, I don't... I wasn't thinking... Sorry, Sam. I wasn't thinking if I, if I was safe with you or not. I was really thinking about me. I was in this safe bubble. I needed greater risk and greater stimulation. I'm sorry if I wasn't that attentive or risky. I'm sorry if I was... It certainly wasn't like the sex I was having with Peter. You might be traumatised after it. I am sorry. I wasn't thinking about you at all. In regard to affections, in regard to risk and danger, and I did say to you that, you know, in the grip of high, that you're the most amazing sexy thing I've ever felt, and it felt amazing. I know you felt it too. But on Monday when you are in the clinic and getting an HIV test, which you were really worried about and feeling bereft and having a rotten come down, I wasn't there. Sorry. Just wasn't there. It wasn't like sex with me and Peter. This is very different. And that's chemsex. And so that's why chemsex is not ecstasy on drugs. That's why chemsex is not. Chemsex is a syndemic. It's a synergy of different things happening. Technology overnight has a revolution changing the way sex was. HIV prevention getting way more complicated and changing pretty much dramatically and overnight for people. These drugs, very different, dr made for sex. Because when the Madonna track came on, I didn't even know. I had something really big up my bum at the time, probably. <laughs> Sorry to be crude. Not only that, but there might be some people in the room that understand drug epidemiology and have studied it even. Um, if I, the availability of drugs to populations is sometimes geographical, it's sometimes circumstance. Um, it's sometimes traffic routes from supply areas. If my sister was... I'm Australian. If my sister was going to come to Liverpool or let's say London to visit me, and if I, as an epidemiologist, was going to worry about her developing a drug problem and I need to know the trajectory of how that happens, she gets off the plane. Um, she'll call me and say hello and she'll get a, find a job and somewhere to live and she'll get a real network of friends, however that happens. I'm not talking about Facebook friends. She'll get a real network of friends to hang out with. You, within a month or three in London, she, someone might offer her a drug through that friendship network. It would probably be a drug appropriate to her population, her demographic, which might be cocaine, I think, but maybe heroin if, she's, if it's that kind of group. Um, she might like it. She had the same childhood as me, so she might like it. Um, <laughs> She might uh, try it again a month later when she runs into those friends again. She might try it a third time a month or two after that. And you know what? Someone might introduce her to a dealer. 
within six months she could know a dealer and be using sort of more frequently. So from getting off the plane to a problem developing, you know, I can estimate six months. My younger gay brother gets off the plane. Before he's hit the tarmac, he's on grinder. I know my younger brother. <laughs> and still on the tarmac, he's being offered crystal meth, methadone and G. He doesn't even have to pay because he's kind of hot. That, geez, that was quick. This technology made one of the, or a couple of the, some of the most harmful drugs super available to an already very vulnerable population, faster than any other population has been introduced to drugs in the history of the world and drugs. It's the fastest delivery of really harmful drugs to a very vulnerable population through this. And they're really struggling with it. And that's chemsex. And, um, and so because it's a, a syndemic and different factors all feeding in to create one new problem called chemsex, that's why we need the multidisciplinary effect. We need to attack it. We need sex. People understand gay sex. We need people to understand gay culture. We need people that understand drugs and motivational interviewing. And we need people who understand the nature of addiction. And we need to know the risk assessment uh, in a drug situation. But my gosh, we also need people to understand HIV and sexual health because this is a population that is phenomenally disproportionately affected by HIV and sexually transmitted infections. And I'll give you an example of just how important that is. Uh, imagine that there are two people sitting, waiting in uh, a standard traditional addiction service um, in the waiting room at an addiction service, waiting for an assessment. One of them is, I'm going to do stereotypes again on this day. I do apologise again, but let's say it's a street homeless heroin injector who is uh, stereotypically HIV negative but probably hep C positive. And the assessment worker is going to uh, look at him and do an assessment. And he'll be ticking all the high risk boxes. Absolutely. Um, uh, injecting drug use, uh, uh, heroin, a, a physically addictive drugs, so he might be physically dependent and having withdrawals. He's street homeless and, and um, perhaps committing crimes to pay for the next fix that he needs. And um, he's possibly sharing needles and transmitting hepatitis C. There's a whole lot of high risk problems there that the drugs worker is going to tick and prioritise. Um, and in regard to the cost to public health, it's probably cost, going to cost thousands of pounds a year to keep that guy engaged in care. So it's probably appropriate that it's a high-risk assessment. Sitting next to him is a young gay man. And he's not using heroin. He's not using any problematic drugs. He's using recreational drugs only. Only once a month, so he's not physically dependent on them. Um, he's not injecting. He's not street homeless. He's HIV negative. He's hep C negative. And the drugs workers are brilliant at their job. But he's not tick ticking a lot of high risk boxes there. But drugs workers are brilliant at their job. I know you are. And you'll do a great behavioural intervention. If that gay man was sitting in front of me in a sexual health setting, the standard questions are, how many partners have you had the last time you used? Because if it's 10, that's a lot of partners that make, puts you um, at risk, a greater risk of infection. Because one in every eight gay men in London is HIV positive. And in sexual health clinics, we know the prevalence within the population that our patient is having sex with. So we know the math in our heads. It's routine of what the risk is. We can actually put a percentage on the chance that he was caught HIV from that last episode. We can also ask standard questions of the sex he had. Now, what if there was an HIV risk in the day before when he was using drugs? We know how to do that assessment. We know if the, how to find out if the person is undetectable. If someone is undetectable with an HIV and they come inside him, do we give them PEP anyway? Do we do that if it's a 15 minute shag? Is it different if they do a, th a four day shag? We know this in sexual health clinics and we have the PEP to keep him safe from catching HIV right there in the same building. That assessment doesn't always happen in drug services, but it's a risk assessment that's entirely appropriate for chemsex. Any drug service that has a chemsex patient in there and doesn't check if there was an HIV risk in the days before and know how to do a PEP assessment and find out if there was a chance of possible transmission and if you don't have PEP on site, know how to get them to that place, even though they might have other priorities because they haven't slept in four days and they might be psychotic. These are important things. Um, in regard to, it's also, if he, was, if he was HIV positive, for instance, or perhaps he was on PrEP, but perhaps he's passing out 
a lot from G overdoses. And we would know, with our pharmacy teams in the sexual health clinics would know, is he passing out because he took too much of the drug? Yeah, possibly. Or is he taking exactly the right amount of drug, but it's interacting with the PrEP medicine that he's on? Because some HIV medicines can boost the levels of drugs in our body. We've got our pharmacists that can tell us the answer to this. It probably doesn't happen in drug services. This is why we need a very multidisciplinary thing. We, no drug service wants to be charged with poor duty of care or of neglecting the needs of very basic risk assessment needs of a guy engaging in those kinds of risks. Um, and that's why chemsex is awkward for all of us, because where does it belong? I fought very hard for drug services. I'm going back to 2006, where I met some of you a long time ago, where I was travelling as, a, as, a, as an activist and as an unpaid volunteer on my own budget. I was travelling up really screaming, because I was younger and more angry then, had more energy, you know, um, for drug services to understand chemsex better. But I was finding it really hard. And then when I went and knocked on the doors of the sexual health clinics, it was like really easy. Because oh. it turns out that gay men go in the thousands to sexual health clinics to talk really easily about their sex lives. They have for 30 years through the AIDS epidemic. It's like an amazing consequence of an AIDS epidemic. I work at 56 Dean Street. <laughs> we have 3,000 gay men coming there every month who use chems. They're not walking in the door saying, help me, I've got a drug problem, or help me, I want to make changes around my drug use. They're walking in saying, gonorrhea, sort me out, please. They're walking in saying, HIV risk, I need PEP, I think. Or they're walking in with the consequences of drug use, with the consequences of drug use, and it's our job not to ignore the, the thing that's, bring, that's causing the problems, but to help them. In the thousands, the drug service, only four minutes walk from 56 Dream Street, where I work, has had three gay men visit their service in the last two years that use those drugs. But 3,000 a month are coming to our clinic. So, I mean, we have to pay attention to our patients' desires and preferences throughout. A consequence of the AIDS epidemic is that gay men walk in very easily without an appointment, without an assessment, without needing to prove their postcode. They can just walk in, their name can be Mickey Mouse and they live in Disneyland and that's fine in sexual health clinics, that's how it works. And um, we'll give them everything they need and they can walk out again. No assessment, no come back later, we'll sort you out, we'll do the assessment today and we'll give you the care later. It's just right now, walk in, walk out. That's how it works. They've been spoiled by this. And so if we're trying to say to gay men, good, 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 there seems to, uh, thank you for disclosing a chemsex issue. If you want to talk about it, we can send you the drug service where they'll do an assessment for you. We hope they'll understand all the other risk assessments, like your PEP needs and the risk assessment, the prevalence of HIV in the population that you're having, that know what safe sex is and what safe sex isn't, considering uh, all the ins and outs of how HIV is transmitted. And, um, um, and to do that assessment, cover all the risks, and then invite them back for an appointment later when the sexual health clinics have teams of health advisors, where if somebody walks in, and the job of a health advisor is if you walk in and if you've had gonorrhea three times in the last six months, you'll sit down and talk to a kind of therapist or somebody trained in motivational interviewing that will talk to you about your gay sex life. We want you to enjoy it more, but experience less of these risks. So how can we talk about you enjoying your sex life more? This is what drug services are competing with if they want to address chemsex. Because it's not traditional drugs work. It's talking about sex. I would say, in and gay sex at that, most of our um, most successful outcomes are not born from doing relapse prevention techniques. They're not so much born from uh, introducing people to cravings and triggers. They're more to do with talking about gay sex. Gay sex in Liverpool in 2017 is about hooking up, being rejected if you don't have abs, being rejected if you're the wrong race, being rejected if you're the wrong size, being robust enough to handle those rejections, not having drugs available to you quite often for free, and if, even if they're not available online, when you show up at places, they are there, and they fix a lot of problems. Being gay in London is about HIV risks and having that fear of catching it in your head, fear of the conversation I'm supposed to ha have. And the most successful outcomes for chemsex and was when we can talk to our patients about managing gay life and gay sex in a big city. And so if the drug services, so the sexual health clinics need the help of drug services because the sexual health clinics don't know how to do motivational interviewing. They do, but they don't necessarily know the, the standard risk assessments for addiction. They don't know, say, for injecting techniques. They don't, um, 
don't often know how to do uh, what relapse prevention is or what a craving management technique is. So they need the drug services to help them. The drug services need the sexual health clinics because of the HIV risk and the sexually transmitted infection risks and safer sex communication skills. And both the sexual health clinics and the drug services need the gay charities big time because we need um, some gay men who understand gay sex and are skilled and trained in how to talk to people about having better gay sex better gay sex and managing internalised homophobia, societal homophobia, rejections online, how to write a profile, how to write a profile that says, I get nervous taking my clothes off with a stranger. It's so much easier if I've had a drink with them first or at least a chat for 20 minutes or even a second date, whatever is best, but I know what makes sex good for me and for me and my, and I'm talking about me, it requires some of that facial recognition stuff that we were doing before. Um, I need that because sometimes when I'm lying in bed with a complete stranger that I met off from Grindr, I feel ugly, I feel unattractive. I know how to perform good sex, I learnt that. But navigating gay sex is really hard. I'm gonna give you another example of how, what, what our patients kind of, what a lot of gay men in, in cities around the world are experiencing in regard to gay sex. And remember, this is not everybody, don't, judge me, but there's a, a lot of the people that, this is some of the issues that is driving the chemsex issues all around the world. So I ask my patients sometimes, it gets a bit rude, so I hope I'm not offensive, but if I ask my patients um, about sober sex, the last time they had sober sex, and if they enjoyed it, and they go, yeah. And I ask them to tell me what is good sober sex, and they might say, you know, they might describe a scenario. And I'll ask them uh, the last time they were perhaps getting a blowjob from somebody, and I'm saying, were well, you lying back, and did your mind just go completely clear, like white, fluffy clouds and blue skies and enjoying the physical sensation of a mouth on my penis and feeling entitled to be enjoying this? Um, or were you lying there getting the blowjob? You walked in at a really rude time. <laughs> um, tick, but there's something going on in your brain, like tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. What am I supposed to do? How long do I stay in this position for? I look really ugly lying like this. I hope he doesn't see me as ugly. Is my dick still hard? Is my dick still hard? What am I supposed to do in reciprocation after this is done? Uh, who will be top? Who will be bottom? Is my dick still hard? Oh my gosh, his finger is sliding down to somewhere. I hope I'm clean. I hope I do. Oh my gosh. How long do I meant to stay like this for? What am I supposed to do in reciprocation? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And you know, if everything goes okay, uh, if the other guy doesn't communicate how ugly this guy feels he is, if two erections happen and if two orgasms happen within reasonable time difference from each other, that's something else I probably have to figure out, tick tock, tick tock, then and everything goes okay and I'm not rejected by the end, then I'll come to 15th Street and say, yeah, I had good sex. I'm like, what? That's not good sex. Who taught you? That's what good sex is. It's an amazing performance. <laughs> and I'm not laughing because that is an amazing performance that you learnt from trial and error and trial and error and lots and lots of perhaps drunken hookups in bars over the years, lots of porn watching. You're very good at that performance. You convinced him that you were confident. You convinced him that you felt sexy. You did all the right things and you measured all of those time differences. You, well done. But don't sit here and tell me that was good sex. We need to start from scratch. And who teaches these guys this? because they can only do that performance on drugs, a lot of them. And that's kind of what's behind chemsex is too. We want to help our guys understand chemsex and manage it, perhaps make changes. They've got to have skills about how to manage that sex life. And you've got to give it to them. See, you see how we need a lot of multidisciplinary work and helping each other out. <sighs> I should think what day is all, today's all about. I got all hot and flustered then, because I was performing sex stuff on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of chem sex, I guess. We're going to have a, a break in a little bit, but I've been here to Liverpool before. I've been to Manchester before. I've been all over and visiting places, and I do these trainings where I teach services how to create a chem sex support service in their town. And then I visit them a year later. I'm not talking about Liverpool necessarily, but I visit them a year later and nothing's happened. And I, or I get an email from, from someone and they say, oh yes, we're waiting for commissioners to do this, so we haven't got the right multidisciplinary team, la 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 la. And I'm not judging, what I'm doing is I'm acknowledging how difficult and scary chemsex is to get it all done. I mean, we're all here because 
there's a lot of teams working together in this city, which is brilliant. I had a visitor from your colleagues in, uh, in Manchester yesterday, which is nice. So I'm, I'm acknowledging, at least in this room, there's a lot of good stuff going on. But what I want to spend the afternoon doing is I don't, I can't do that thing again where I train people to set up a service and I come back and it's not done or they're still struggling or they don't feel skilled. We've got to come from a different angle. So I'm coming from a really different angle today. Wherever you work, I don't care if you're setting up a service or not, but wherever you work, in fact, everyone in this room has had a person who engages in chemsex sitting in front of them one-to-one -one at some point. Is everyone? Is there anyone who'd never had a guy who engages in chemsex sitting in front of them? Okay. That, that, you're the minority. I saw three hands on this before. Wherever you work, you've got to be able to um, support the person in front of you. Sometimes referring people on. You all know the person who, the type of service that, ref, that doesn't know how to handle this, so refers it to someone else. Not even sure if it's the right person to do. And we've all seen, known that patient or client that gets handed around and passed the buck and passed the buck and passed the buck because no one really knows how to do with it. There's a lot of that happening with chemsex. There's a lot of um, chemsex patients that go to the drug service and they get passed off over to the, the gay charity. And the gay charities, which has seemed like a good idea because it seemed mostly about gay sex, but the gay man at the gay charity doesn't know enough how to do this. So he passes him on to the sexual health clinic. And the sexual health clinic knows how to help him with his HIV prevention and STIs, but they don't know how to do the relapse prevention. So he gets passed around and around and around and ends up being nowhere. <laughs> and so what this afternoon is about, <laughs> um, every single one of you is going to know, if someone is sitting in front of you and they say, hi, uh, yeah, I, I do do party drugs for sex sometimes, and yeah, maybe I do want to do something about it, and I, what I'm giving you is you don't have to refer them anywhere. I'm gonna, you, within half an hour, I'm going to give you the skills to help that person make a plan to change their behaviour or be safer. and you are going to be skilled to do it before you leave. Um, so this next part is about very practical how to help somebody who's using chem. So the example I use is a person called Doris. Doris is 54 years old. She's a housewife. Uh, well, she's a married woman. She lives in the countryside with her husband. She's never had a gay friend before. Um, but she does work in some kind of health sector role where um, she might come across somebody who says they do chems or, or, enga or engage in chem sex. And so I designed something for her because it would be great, wouldn't it, if all the guys that were using uh, chems problematically would just go willingly and without any shame boldly into their drug service and get a proper help. But that's not how it's over. They're turning up at accident and emergency departments. They're turning up at sexual health clinics, obviously, in the HIV centers. They're turning up at therapists' doors, at counsellors' doors. They're turning up at the drug services. They're turning up at the buses where you get needle exchange. They're also turning up, they're turning up in all the places, except really where we want them to, which is the drug services. <coughs> So it means that regardless of where we work, we're going to have to be really skilled at identifying that our patients or clients are, are using chems um, and doing that thing which is motivational interviewing. Is motivational interviewing alien to anyone in the room? Uh, don't be embarrassed. Does everyone have a clue what motivational interviewing is? Good. It's, um, it's, it works very well with people who use drugs, but it also works really well, as an example, with... Um, Let's say someone's been out of work for uh, two decades, for 20 years, they haven't, haven't had a job. And um, the job centre is trying to maybe get them involved, or their social worker perhaps trying to get them involved in work again. But this is, they, they'll say things like, yeah, like I'm a creative type, you know, I like being unemployed, I, you know, I'm not designed for that nine to five. Um, I'm kind of a creative guy and I, I would never fit in there, I don't wear suits, you know, I'm really creative. I like all this spare time, it suits me really, really well. I don't want a job, I'm, I'm a different kind of person. But, you know, sometimes what they're saying is, I'm so bored, I don't know what to do with my time. It kind of just leads me to trouble a lot, actually. Um, it's just that I'm really scared to get a job because I'm so unskilled, they'll just laugh at me if I go to a job interview. I'm too old, um, I can't learn stuff, I feel like I've missed my boat in that regard. And all this, rather than say out loud, I'm scared of this, they're saying, yeah, I don't want a job anyway. 
And motivational interviewing is kind of designed to help a person who is either in denial or ambivalent or fearful or, or um, you know, uh, of making any changes at all. Because it'd be so frightening making life changes. So frightening. And motivational interviewing was designed for the worker to help put the, the person in touch with those fears, overcome those fears, that feel more emboldened and empowered to move forward and make the changes that they want to do. So it's not tricking or coercing or manipulating someone into um, wanting to get a job, for instance. It's just giving them the skills to identify that, <laughs> yes, I'm a bit scared. And, and do you say you can help me overcome this and maybe move forward and get the things I want? Great. That's what motivational interviewing is. Perfect for drug use. So Doris, wherever she works, she might not be very good at motivational interviewing. But what we are asking is anyone who is working anywhere in health, whether it's A&E or sexual health or a drug service or a PEP assessment or a gay charity or a, or a gay therapist or a, any kind of therapist, just to ask some basic questions, not the standard ones like are you an injecting drug user or are you an illicit drug user, but do you use party drugs for sex? You asked me a question earlier about um, how many, what percentage of them are using problematically. And that's a really hard answer, que question to answer because if a person catches gonorrhea eight times a year, and that's the only consequence of their chemsex, but if they catch it eight times a year and transmit it on to dozens of others, we might consider that a problem, but the person using the drug might not consider that problematic. A person might consider, I don't mind catching a disease myself, but no, I don't want to pass it on to other people. That might be their line of where problematic is. Um, some people might not care about catching HIV, but they might not want to pass it on to someone else. Some people might be experiencing, um, they haven't seen their mum in a year. Gosh, they haven't had sober sex in four years. They are paranoid quite a lot and they're using every weekend and they haven't seen their best friend for a long time either. But that's not a problem for them. But we might assume it's a problem, might be a problem for us. People working in sexual health, we are charged with managing the transmission of HIV and STIs in our community. So we might see something as problematic, but the patient doesn't. And so it, this is probably not big news for people who work in drug services, but this is kind of what we're trying to help Doris with to understand this. So the questions we're wanting you all to ask is not the standard questions about drugs that might exist on your pro formas or on your assessments, but just in a conversational way, do you use party drugs for sex? because this is not heroin, this is not addiction, this is not substance abuse or substance misuse, just using party drugs for sex. And as I mentioned before, we noticed 10% of people saying, yes, I do illicit drugs, yes, I, um, uh, I'm, I have had sex with an injecting drug user. But when asked different questions, it was up to 100% of people responding more honestly. So it's how we ask the questions that help people to disclose more honestly. So we're asking Doris to say, do you use party drugs for sex? What's your favourite one? Are you having a good time? And the person is going, oh, so we're not judging. You're actually asking if you have a good time. Yeah, I want to know if you're enjoying it. Sex is meant to be enjoyable, no? So that's, we understand why you're using the drugs. Um, it can sometimes be about using colloquial terms like chems, if you want, or party drugs. Use your own, what you're comfortable with yourself. <coughs> but if Doris was working, again, she doesn't have any gay friends, she doesn't know much about gay life, she knows nothing about chemsex, it's all a bit shocking to her, but she does, has been trained by some tall, handsome Australian man to ask three questions. Do you use party drugs for sex? What's your favorite, with a big smile on her face. What's your favorite one, are you having a good time? And if the guy goes, yeah, I use chems, but it's not a problem and I can stop any time I want, all right? And she goes, okay, good, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying your sex and thanks for answering honestly. Um, if, just so long as you know, if anything changes, if you find that you haven't had sober sex in a long time or you're like getting paranoid and you're not enjoying it or perhaps getting more STIs than you wanted or if, if, if anything changes, I promise, please do come back and tell me because I'm not a chemsex expert or anything, but I do know that this is not a standard addiction problem. I'm not just going to send you to a heroin clinic. I'm, I'm going to sit down and talk with you. I get that it's about gay sex and grinder and hooking up and a whole lot of other strange youth, things unique to you. So do come back if that changes and I promise we'll, together we'll bang our heads together and find out the right care for you. And he's going away like, oh, all right. Not feeling judged. He doesn't have a problem. But I tell you what, six weeks later when he has that psychotic episode again, when he's paranoid, when he's wanking and he, there's, he thinks there's people listening under the door, 
that he starts putting all this furniture next to the door so that they can't hear him. And, and then when he wakes up the next day, he realizes, oh my God, because that's a very normal thing. They might not be telling us this, but this is a very normal thing. 80% of our people who do chems, it finishes with that kind of experience. Sometimes it's people were listening to him on my phone or I couldn't, I had to put tape over the webcam when I was masturbating and watching porn. I had to, there were people listening to me, I couldn't leave the house. Or I was trying to watch porn, but I spent six hours just, they are there, I can hear them. It's very normal and they're not likely to tell us. They have a great time for the two days before, but the third day is very much like them. So six weeks later, when he, that happens again, he'll remember Doris promising not to send him to an addictions clinic or heroin centre. She he remembers Doris saying, we get that this is a bit different for you and we'll find a way to do it. And he comes back. And when he comes back to another Doris, Doris says the same questions again. Do you use party drugs for sex? What's your favourite one? Are you having a good time? <coughs> and this time the person goes, yes, I want to, uh, yes, I'm here, I want to do something about it. And Doris is like, yikes, oh no, he said yes. Um, but what she will say is, I'm so glad you came back and you told me cool. So I'm not an expert on chem sex and I, I'm way out of my depth here, but I'm not just going to send you on to another person who's out of their depth. He'll send you on to another, I promise we're not going to do that. I know you might have been through that already. So um, I don't, I'm not gay. I don't know much about chem sex, but you are an expert and I'm here, I'm listening. I want you to teach me everything because I need to understand. I'm not judging. And I've got some other skills too. So together we'll work it out. The first thing we could do is let's turn on the computer and bring up this chemsex care plan. Now the next part, I'm talking about this chemsex care plan which is actually on my website but I just want you to be very clear, I'm not selling anything, it's not branded, it's not, um, no one gives me money for this, no one makes money from this. Anyone that puts data into this, it's not collected or researched. Um, anyone that puts data or information into it, it just goes in and it just disappears. It's for their own use only. This is an, a tool made by an activist for his gay community. It has no other purpose. So I'm not promoting or boasting anything. And the first page that Doris would get up would be um, this chemsex care plan. I'm going to have to be over here now. So the first page that would come up is uh, a care plan. And Doris is going through this with her patient or client together. And four options come up. And she'll go, do, do any of these apply to you? And he goes, first of all, abstinence, no. Hardly anyone picks that one. <laughs> um, or is it take a short break, play more safely? And if, for instance, he chooses abstinence, and again, that doesn't happen often. When a person is ready for abstinence, they're usually not ha needing Doris to do this kind of motivational interview. They've mo they kind of made a decision. They're probably going to seek out somewhere more professional, like perhaps a drug server, somewhere more experienced with addiction. But if he chose this, the next page would just introduce him to the fact that this is quite a change of life that he's committing to. It involves sometimes changing your friends. It can involve changing habits. It can be involved learning a whole lot of skills, like you're going to have triggers, you're going to have cravings. You're going to have to really really change your whole life and it's quite a commitment. So there are a whole lot of inf information here in videos but there's also some um, links to 12-step programs in the city, in, in the city that you're in. And, um, but like I said, no one hardly ever really chooses this. But it might suggest towards the end um, trying to do this in smaller chunks. Um, a drugs worker is trying to help someone to achieve a goal. If the goal is never to use again, the only way to achieve it is to be with the client on their deathbed at the end of their life and they haven't done any drugs, goal achieved. Not many of us can do that. So it's always better to work in small achievable goals. So, but nonetheless, abstinence is a choice that is there. And, but let's say he wants to play more safely. He just wants harm reduction permission. He's going to use, he doesn't want to stop, thank you for asking, but he does want to be safer about it. And so that page just takes you to standard harm reduction, chemsex specific harm reduction stuff. Um, harm reduction use of the drugs themselves, harm reduction in regard to sex, harm reduction in, rega in regard to negotiating things online, going to a stranger's place. I'm sorry to have to bring it up, but we've had um, the, a chemsex serial killer in London called Stephen Port. We've had uh, 
chemsex cop killer, Breaking Bad style thing. So, I mean, it can be dangerous hooking up line. It's good to have some skills about how to manage that really safely. Um, <laughs> and how to be safer within the chemsex environment. So it's not just about drugs, it's not just about sex, but it's about managing the chaos that can sometimes happen in a three-day environment full of people who are really high and haven't slept for a few days, maybe paranoid. Um, and of course, this, is links to, uh, this is, has links to some of the services that I admire most that have great harm reduction information on. Happy to link to some more. Um, what quite a lot of Doris's patients or clients say is, yeah, I'm using drugs, yeah, it's getting a hand, but I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do about it. So we, we can't, we, drugs workers usually trying to get our patients to identify a goal, but I have to say, at this early stage, where they're just identifying that it might be a problem, it's a bit much for us to ask them to identify a goal to work towards. Sometimes they're just not sure. What can be really helpful is this page where they're not sure, where it just takes them to a series of questions, reflective questions. This is motivational interviewing at its most classic. Um, helping a person get in touch with but it's questions like, what do I enjoy about sex? What do I dislike about chemsex? What's the best sex I've ever had? The worst sex I've ever had? Am I missing days at work? Have I not seen my mum for a year? Um, um, is this happening every weekend? Is it what I'm looking forward to most, more than the cinema? Am I losing interest in all the other things that my friends invite me to? Is this my priority? Um, um, have I ever overdosed? Some people overdose every single weekend, but they don't identify that a problem until it's pointed out that they're doing it every weekend. Um, if they're feeling paranoid, if they're coming across other paranoid people, if that's how they're in, if, if, if they're dealing every single weekend with managing other people's paranoias, is that how they wanted their sex life to be? So questions to help people reflect on the consequences of their use, which they might never have done before. A lot of drug use of all kinds is about if, I'm ha if I want drugs now, I'm going to think of the first 10 minutes after I take the drugs into my body. That's all I can think about. I'm not thinking about the money I spent or the things in my diary tomorrow, or the consequent, no. The dopamine that's released in anticipation of drugs makes me just think about now, 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 now. Some people can use drugs for years without ever thinking that there are consequences because all they think about is it's good, it's good, it's good. And they might need our help to remind them there are consequences and you have the, we can help our patients and clients to identify the consequences of their use. It's just reflective questions to help them reflect on their own use, reflect on the sex they want, reflect on the role chems are playing in their sex life. It's a whole lot of questions, a lot more than I've got here on the slides. They just go on and on and on and on. What percentage of your sex life is on chems? What percentage of your sex life is sober? What would you prefer it to be? Ticking those boxes is a very powerful gesture and realisation tool when, when we ask our patients to do this. And basic questions like, what are the obstacles to making changes? If people are frightened or feel disempowered or they can only see the negatives of making changes, writing those down out loud helps us to support them to overcome those fears. And of course, if the choice they make, and this is my favourite one, this is where Doris can be the most effective, is because abstinence is such a giant goal. Harm reduction is good, but I have to say, there's a hell of a lot of harm reduction information, not just available online from health services, including a lot of you here sitting in front of me, but there's also a lot of um, colloquial, uh, sort of uh, within the community harm reduction. Like, I'm surprised how good gay men who have never looked at a, a harm reduction website, have never sat in front of a professional, they know how to use drugs safely. It's amazing how good a community can be in sharing harm reduction information amongst themselves. We don't have a lot of people coming to us in this modern technological age like they did 20 years ago with um, traditional drug use where they would come to give harm reduction information. They're getting it online the way they get everything online. And they're also scared that if they come to us for harm reduction information, we're going to give them a lecture and coerce them into making changes. So they kind of tend to do it on their own. But it's good to have the harm reduction stuff there. But my favourite way to help Doris is, so abstinence is too big a goal. Harm reduction is important but it's not often about making uh, uh, changes in the drug use. Having some questions about reflecting on our own use is something that can help a person come to a more determined decision about do I want to make changes or not. But making changes, this is the way to do it. A nurse who just took someone's blood to, to test them for HIV, they didn't come to talk about drugs. They're having a great time, no problem at all. But 
a nurse can say, do you want to take a break for just two weeks if it's happening every week? It's never occurred to them before. Um, a person uh, who's giving out harm reduction information in the drug service, say, okay, so you just want some clean needles. Here you go, off you go. But, um, do you want to take a break? They, sometimes they think the only option is stopping altogether and identifying as an addict or carrying on exactly the same way. We're presenting them with a different kind of option of just taking a break for a while. <laughs> a, a break can be a time to reflect on your sex life and the role comes of playing in it. It can be uh, a time to prove to yourself that you have some control over this. So when I'm suggesting to my patients, do you want to take a short break? I usually say, how often is this happening? Maybe I've taken their blood for HIV and I say, do you use chems or party drugs for sex? Okay, yeah, I say, having a good time? Awesome. Good. What's the best sex you've ever had? When was the last time? How often is it happening? How often are you using chems? Oh, every weekend. Okay. Um, you know that, we, uh, you know, we don't, if you, if you say you wanted to make some changes, it doesn't mean we're going to send you an addiction service and you have to identify as an addict. As simple as, you know, we can help you to take um, one weekend off. You know, there's some things that could happen in that week if you decided to take a weekend off. Um, uh, you will have triggers and cravings and moments when you really want to use. But maybe you, you're sitting here, you're telling me you don't have a problem. Cool, I want to believe you. Prove it to me. Um, or prove it to yourself. If you think you're losing control, taking one weekend off, coming back to me and saying, yeah, I had a weekend off, so you were wrong. And I'll go, okay, good, I'm glad. And that's just an empowering thing to engage them in a change. So if they did pick this, if Doris wanted to, Doris knows nothing about chemsex support, knows nothing about motivational interviewing, but she's going through this website with her client. Um, it's just going to ask him, how long does he want to take a break for? Now, he really likes Doris and he's feeling really ambitious. He doesn't have a problem at all. So he's going to be really ambitious. He's going to say three months, I'll stop for three months. And when he clicks that, it takes him to a page where it's asking, how confident are you you can do this? Remember, he's probably using every weekend. So the next page, he's not very confident to do this. So the next page will say, look, there's no point picking something that's too unachievable. We want you to pick an achievable goal. Coming back here as a failure after three months doesn't help Doris at all. Coming back as a, as a success after one week of doing this makes the patient feel, wow, emboldened, capable, very aware of what they can do, motivated to do more, less frightened of how much of a problem it is because they know they can do it. So we want them to pick a very small, achievable goal to work towards. We don't want to be on their deathbed giving them, for the first time in their life, a goal accomplishment. We want them to give a whole lot of goal accomplishments over a period of time. An example, for instance, is I've got a, I've got a whole bunch of sisters. <coughs> and if one of my sisters is sitting there and there's a chocolate cake in front of her and she's trying to decide, do I eat this chocolate cake or not? She's getting married in three weeks' time. She wants to fit into a wedding dress. She's going on a beach honeymoon afterwards, so she wants to fit into her beach um, costume, swimming costume. And she, with all that in mind, she's deciding whether to eat this chocolate cake. Now, this sister that I'm talking about, she's been married three times before. <laughs> every time she got married, she fitted into a wedding dress. And every time she went married, she fitted into a swimming costume. She's got a history of accomplishing goals behind her. So when she comes to make this decision-making process of do I eat the chocolate cake or do I not, she's got a motivation and she feels like she can achieve that goal because there's a history of it. Awesome. Because I told you I've got a bunch of sisters. I've got another sister who has also got a chocolate cake in front of her and she's got a decision-making process happening too. Do I eat the chocolate cake or not? She's also getting married in three weeks' time. She also wants to fit into the wedding dress and the bikini. She's been married three times before as well. She's never fitted into her wedding dress, ever. Every time she tries, she always fails, has to get a change of the day, and she's never got that swimming costume body for the honeymoon. So she's got a decision-making process of do I eat this cake? She's got a motivation for the wedding, but she's never achieved it before, and that's factoring into whether she's going to eat the chocolate cake or not. She's probably going to eat the chocolate cake. I mean, why bother? This is why we're helping our patients and clients to achieve small goals. We want to build up a history of accomplishment. I can do this. Accomplishment. I can do this. Bit by bit by bit in small stages. Um, it's amazing when you see somebody, I've got a problem with drugs and I'm really scared, I'm going to stop, it's really, really hard. Every time I try to stop, these cravings happen. I used again and again and again. Yeah, I tried to stop last week, but I did it again and again. And you can see them slumped in a chair, feeling terrible. And, and we're trying to say, um, you maybe give it a break, it's worth it. But they've got a history of failures. And what we're trying to do is get the tiniest thing that's so easy for them to achieve. Maybe it's only two days 
Maybe seven days is too much for them, but we want them to feel that accomplishment. And if they have two days they, and they don't do drugs for two days and they come and see me two days later, <coughs> they did it. And they're sitting taller in the chair, they're feeling accomplished, and Doris did that for them. And so this is the point of the, the take a break kind of um, model. <coughs> so this page is going to ask, suggest that he chooses a small achievable goal, like seven days. And it'll take him back again to say, how confident are you that you can achieve this goal, this seven day goal? Because now, it's much more accomplishable. It's much easier than three months. He feels confident, he's motivated. That chocolate cake decision, he thinks he can do it. And so it'll come back to another page. We'll say, okay, so we know how confident you are. Is it important to you? Doing this job, helping somebody make changes around drugs is pointless unless they've got a reason to do it, a motivation. My sister's had the wedding dress. Does anyone want to offer a suggestion to why a, a person who enjoys the best sex of his entire life on these amazing drugs, why they would want to stop? It's impacting their professional life. Okay, so a negative consequence. Okay. So there are negative consequences that uh, avoiding the negative consequences is one way, one motivation. Um, do you think there are any motivations that are not about the negative, but it's better without? Maybe they want to remember, fully remember. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Yes, okay, so enjoying uh, remembering better sex. I think that uh, was kind of a trick question because when we were talking about the 67-year-old guy before, how old was he, 74 or something? I'd like to say to the 74-year-old man, you're going to have the, most, the best sex you've had, ever had on these drugs, yes, but you're going to have amazing sex without drugs and amazing, that feeling of sexual liberation and inclusion in a sexy community. I can't convince him of that. That's his wedding dress motivation. He doesn't believe it. So if we're going to ask a person if it's important to achieve their goal and we're going to try to talk to them about motivation and what their reason is, just because I don't want to be psychotic every weekend, that's good a motivation, but it's always better to find something that's a little more, not just avoiding the bad, but accomplishing the good, um, if we can. But it can be really hard with chem sex particularly because it's, it is the best sex they've ever had. It kind of is. I like to say to my patients that they will, sober sex is different from chem sex. Um, I'd like to say that it's better. It's even better. It's different, but it's even better in a different kind of way. They kind of don't believe. <laughs> they don't believe. It's, you know, there is nothing like arousal when your dopamine is that much released on those drugs. So I like to think that there are other things like intimacy and connection and affirmation and approval and, and love and being hugged and all these other things that are better that they'll achieve with it, but it's hard for them to take this on board. Nonetheless, we're going to ask them how important it is to achieve the goal. And if it's not important to them, Maybe the only reason they're there is because the nurse told him to go and talk to the chems advisor, talk to Doris. Maybe his boyfriend or his mum said, you need to go and talk to that Doris at that clinic because you've got a problem. And he doesn't really care. He doesn't care about making changes. It's not important to him. So if it's not important to him, really low, like three, then it'll say, come back later, go home. Doris will say, there's no point being here. I want to help you, not your boyfriend. You're sitting in front of me, not your mum. Um, it's kind of a trick question because when a person says, I don't care about myself out loud, it's kind of a realisation. So this is a kind of reflective question that a person sort of go, I don't care about, um, it's not important to me to make drugs. It's, when they say it out loud, it's a realisation and it kind of can trigger them into wanting to prove that they can do this or make some changes. So it's not exactly tricking them, but it's, it's bringing something to the surface that might have been hidden. It's classic motivational interviewing. I can see some confused faces. Is that a question on your face? No, that no? Really hit you oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry to have ashamed you that way. Um, it, I, this is the hardest thing to understand for me to explain, but it does. Um, if someone says to me, if, if I'm running around having, let's say, sex without condoms and uh, nearly catching HIV from, from risky sexual behaviour and stuff. And someone, and it seems fine to me because I'm having great sex, but somebody says, do you care about catching HIV? And I go, no. You know, just saying it out loud kind of makes a realisation. So it's the same kind of thing here with drugs. So that's why that question is there. <coughs> so we're just going to say, 
It's not important to you. Go home. We'll be here. Doris is going to be for ages, or Doris's colleague will be here. There's a website will be here. Come back when you want to do something about it. It's really just rem reminding our patient and client that we're helping them. We're not trying to coerce them or change them. It's about their choices, their agency over their own choices. Um, but uh, if, of course, it wasn't important to them and they don't want to make any changes, you can always suggest them to go back to that, those reflective questions about the role that the chems and sex are playing, and that might help them you know, explore that a bit more. But let's assume that it is important to them, because it usually is, um, and it's like 9 out of 10 important. Just, a, just saying that out loud, it's important to me to do this. Just acknowledging that and ticking that box is a powerful gesture. So that's when the work begins. So the next taken to a page, which is the very basic of, of, um, of drugs work, I guess, behaviour change around drugs. If he's got a plan for seven days that he's told Doris about, he's not going to use for seven days, so what could go wrong? Well, the first thing I'd ask is, um, what could go wrong? First thing I'd ask is, things are going to go wrong. You might have a plan sitting here with me today, deciding you're not going to do it for seven days. Sounds really easy, but there's going to be a Saturday night within the next seven days when you're lonely or bored, or there's going to be times when you don't really care as much as you do sitting in front of me and all my inspirational, motivational stuff that Doris has. So is the whole seven days going to be really hard, or are there particular moments? Like, are you going to... Do you have cravings do you want to use on a Tuesday morning when you're getting ready for work? No? Okay, so in Thursday afternoons when you're having lunch with your colleagues at work, is that when you have an overwhelming urge? No? Okay, so is it on Friday nights when you've had seven drinks in a, in a pub and you're sitting home on the tube and switching on grinder? Oh, right, okay. Uh, is it when you're home alone and your friends are at... Oh, okay, so there are actual times within the next seven days that you're most vulnerable. This next page is helping our patient identify the most vulnerable moments. And in, in, in your case, it's Friday nights after, after quite a few drinks or being alone and watching Grindr or playing on Facebook and everyone's having a great time on Saturday night and you're all alone. That might be a trigger. So first thing he's going to do is tick the most vulnerable times in the next seven days so that he can identify those moments and be ready for them. Um, if being alone on the Friday night is a, a, an upsetting time for you, then get your friend around. It's a special thing. Invite your friend to the cinema. Do something. Stay at a friend's place. Put something in place. And first of all, don't be surprised when it happens because this is helping you anticipate the most vulnerable moments. There are other things like triggers that set us off. Um, some people, it's after they've had a fight with their mum on the phone. Um, some people, it's um, when they're horny. For some people, it's when a, a topless guy comes up on Facebook. For some people, it's when they just flick on Grindr just for no reason at all, and suddenly there's all these affirmations, sexual affirmations coming. For some people, it's when they're lonely. For some people, it's when they're really angry. For some people, it's when their boyfriend has, uh, give, has betrayed them in some way and they want to get revenge. Um, there's a whole lot of triggers that our patient or client might not be expecting, and this page is helping him get really familiar. He'll tick box the ones that are appropriate to him. So again, he's prepared for the next seven days He's going to know and anticipate the moments when these triggers and cravings are going to happen. He's jotting them all down in tick boxes. There's also some other questions about the role of other non-chem sex drugs, like quite a lot of my patients, if they, they, I ask my patient, in the last year you've done 10 benders. How many of those were, began with drinking, like after four or five drinks with friends and sitting home on the tube? Or how many began completely sober? And quite often, it's, it's a quite, quite a mix. Some people say, oh, if I don't have any drinks, so I'm confident I won't use. It only happens when I've had four or five drinks. Well, OK, so we're talking about an alcohol issue there then. In order to address your chems for the next seven days, in order for you to accomplish your goal, it's really about addressing the alcohol. I might invite them to take seven days off alcohol. There's so much fear when you talk about stopping alcohol with people who use it regularly. Drugs workers in the room, you've seen that look on people's faces. <laughs> So I usually say just, I ask people, oh, after how many drinks? Let's imagine you're sitting on the train going home after drinking on a Friday night with your friends and you're bored on the train, you put on grinder like, like you do. Um, if you've had two drinks, is that likely to turn into chem sex? If you've had four drinks, is that likely to? Tell me, at how many drinks do you start losing the power to um, be, have conviction around not using drugs? So it's a negotiation with them about how to achieve their goal of the next seven days of not using. 
And it can be the same with doing a line of cocaine or an ecstasy in a nightclub. That might put them in that state of mind where they're more likely to use as well. And reminding them that this is just a seven-day plan. It's not the rest of their life. So we're not talking about giving up alcohol for the rest of their life or having or, or avoiding clubs or uh, putting things in place. It's just seven days. Reminding them we're only talking about seven days because they get very relieved when they're reminded it's only seven days. And then, of course, despite knowing all their triggers, despite knowing their vulnerable moments in the next week, they will have cravings. And I apologise. It's going to happen. It's kind of inevitability. Um, but you're not powerless to them. There's things you, you, you can do. A craving usually, in my patient's experience, in my own, manifests as an angel sitting here and a devil sitting here. I want to, but I shouldn't. I want to, but I shouldn't. I want to, but I shouldn't. Let's just imagine that I'm in my room experiencing a craving and you're just observing me silently. I don't know you're there. I'm alone in my room and you're watching me and my behaviour, OK? So there's the angel sitting here, there's the devil sitting here. I want to, but I shouldn't. I want to, but I shouldn't. I want to, but I shouldn't. I'm shallow breathing as I try to resolve this intellectually, this decision. I'm sure if I think about it enough, I'll know how to dissolve this decision of whether to use or whether to not use. And I'm shallow breathing as I think this is a very anxious kind of decision that I'm making up here in my head and I'm trying to resolve it. And I've kind of, I lost track of what day it is or what room I'm in. And I'm shallow breathing, getting more anxious and in this me, me, me anxiety. I'm going to end up using. You can see it, right? This state I'm putting myself in. A craving is not an intellectual thought process to be resolved. A craving is an emotional state we're in that we're responding to. It's an anxiety state we're putting ourselves in. I want you to watch me again as I deal with a craving uh, differently. I'm alone in my room. You're watching me. There's the angel sitting here and there's the devil sitting here. The first thing I'm going to do is take a deep breath in and smile and breathe. And keep breathing. Um, I'm not going to be able to resolve it by thinking about it. So I'm going to come back to planet Earth, <sighs> keep smiling and breathing, remind myself what day is and what era. I'm going to look at my diary and see what I'm doing next week. Um, best thing to do would be call a friend. And I don't have to say, hello, friend, I'm a raging addict and I'm having a craving. I can just sort of say, hi, what did you do today? And my friend's going to say, oh, mum did that. And that same person at work did the same thing again. And it's going to, just going to lift me out of this me, 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 me state and engage empath empathically with somebody else and take me out of that sort of state. Um, I'm going to open the blinds. So I was in here, these lights are all wrong. I would definitely turn any screen off because these screens, screens flicker even invisibly and could add to my anxiety. They might also represent the avenues to which I achieve drugs and sex too. It might be about porn, it might be about the availability of drugs on my grinder. So I'm just turning them off. I'm going outside. I don't care if it's hailing or raining. I haven't got a friend to call. I'm going to go and buy a Snickers bar from the shop, even if it's two in the morning. And I'm going to ask the guy selling me Snickers, how was your day? He'll just grunt because it's two in the morning. He doesn't care. But I'm engaging with someone else rather than just being in this me, 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 <laughs> panicky, anxious state. A craving is an emotional state we put ourselves in and we can get ourselves out of it. It takes some practice. But this page is really introducing our client. It's not about us telling him how to manage a craving. It's about him choosing options that he finds on here. And it goes on and on and on as well, lots of options. You might have your own suggestions of how to change your emotional state that you can use. But this helps the patient choose things that he might find to make the craving go away. And then that's it. So Doris has been, this person came to see Doris for whatever reason, but it wasn't about chems. But she asked him, do you use party drugs for sex? With a big smile on her face. What's your favourite one? Are you having a good time? He said, I would like to make some changes, perhaps yes. She at first was a little shocked, but she remembered her training and she said, good, I'm glad you told me. I promise I'm not going to send you to an addiction service. I get that this is more about chems. I get that you're not fully investing in all this. It's just exploring this. I promise I'm not going to send you to a series of past the buck appointments with people who don't feel qualified to do this. Bless them. We'll figure it out ourselves. Let's look at this thing. And she's done it online. In only in the space of 15 minutes, Doris of ignorance has, he now has a plan for seven days to not use chems. He feels confident he can do it. And he told Doris it's important to him. Wow. He has identified the most vulnerable moments in the next seven days that are going to make him most likely to use, and he's put some different things in place. 
So identify the triggers, the things that are probably likely to set him off. So he's an, an, going to anticipate them, be ready for them when they happen. He's also tick boxed some things he can do when he has a craving that will help him to pass, including being linked to some videos of a, a tall, handsome Australian guy on YouTube talking him through those things if he wants. It's not a perfect solution. It's not an abstinence program. It's not done by a properly trained drugs worker. It's not done by a properly a guy that a gay guy that understands Grinder. It's done by Doris with a bit of online help by owning the fact that she's not perfect because nobody is. I'm not. And he's got a plan to make changes in the next seven days. He can come back in seven days. He will have learnt where he went wrong, where he went right. If he did use, then we can go through that tick box and see which things he didn't put in place. Or did it happen during one of those vulnerable moments he was expecting? Or are there others that he didn't tick box? So it's a kind of a learning experience. But hopefully, it wasn't too big a goal. He'll have learnt a lot whether he did use or didn't. He'll have learned a lot, but maybe accomplished something and achieved a goal. That's a, that's, a, that's a wedding gown kind of goal that he's achieved. That's one thing in his history that he accomplished and Doris helped him to do that. So if it's more problematic, if this little light uh, online intervention with Doris isn't enough, if there's problematic daily use or really risky stuff going on, complicated injecting, a real complex mental health issues driving the behaviour, Doris knows how to, you know, reach out and find other kind of help. But at a first point of call, she's just done a 15 minute intervention. She's not perfectly trained, nobody is. And she's helped a patient have a care plan of seven days uh, or with a bit of online help. <sighs> is that something that you can use tomorrow if someone came and was sitting in front of you? What are the questions you're gonna ask? Do you use party drugs for sex? <coughs> What's your favourite one? Having a good time. Um, and then I promise not to send you to an addiction service. I promise that this is more about gay sex and gay life and grinder and some gay cultural issues. And I get that you're not uh, uh, here to change your whole life and give up sex. So we're just going to go through this light plan to help you make changes for seven days and give you some skills so that you are empowered to make changes. And that was Doris who knows nothing. She knows less than you. Um, so that's kind of Chem 6. I hope it's helpful. What's on my next slide? Question. That's what, that's what, that's what the Chem 6 care plan does. Everyone's happy and chem free. <laughs> <laughs> um, that means I meant to put it out to questions. So this is, it's available online. There's also lots of other things. There's links to YouTube videos. There's links to other sites that have harm reduction information. Because David Stewart is not the only source of Chem 6 expertise in the world. There's Lots of it here in the room, um, but there is lots of links on that side.